Hi everyone, my name is Antonio Prunos and my presentation is going to be on asexuality and it is mainly intended as a primer for sex therapists and uh, sex counsellors. The first question is, what is asexuality? Asexuality has been defined as a lack of sexual attraction for anyone, male or female. It is conceptualized as a relatively stable, trait-like, dispositional characteristic and it is now considered the fourth main category of sexual orientation, together with straight, gay, lesbian, and bisexual. In, although asexuality is a relatively new concept, asexual people have been known since the very origin of research in sexuality. In 1948, Alfred Kinsey published the results of a survey on the sexual habits of a large sample of American people, men and women, and he discovered that around 1.5% of the general population could not be classified in any of the theorized categories of sexual orientation. He named this new group of people as individuals with no social sexual contacts or reactions. It must be noticed, however, that Kitsi based his classification mainly on sexual behavior, while the current definition of asexuality, as we have seen before, focuses on attraction. So when assessing sexual orientation, a third component, which is equally important, should be considered, that is identity. So we can consider sexual orientation as a multidimensional construct, which includes the gender or genders of the sexual partners we have, the direction of our attraction, or the identity label we use to identify ourselves. The three components can be aligned, as it happens to most people, or disaligned, so it must be kept in mind that an accurate assessment of sexual orientation should include multiple criteria at a time. This is particularly relevant when it comes to figure out the prevalence of asexual people in the general population. If we consider the behavioral criterion, the prevalence rates of asexuality is around 1% based on the historical study by Kinsey in the US and on data collected more recently in the UK and then replicated in other English-speaking countries in the rest of the world. The same issue, that is the multidimensional nature of sexual orientation, emerged in a research study on a large sample of people recruited on the Evan website, the largest asexual community on the internet. Around 71% of the sample self-identified as asexual, around 70% define their asexuality in terms of attraction and around 50% in terms of behavior. Only one third of the sample fulfilled the three criteria at a time. So what about the people who do not identify as asexual? Although self-identification was the most inclusive criterion for the people in the Avon community, around one participant out of three did not identify as asexual although being part of that community. This group includes people who are questioning, people who identify according to their romantic orientation rather than their sexual orientation, for example, as be romantic, and people who identify as demisexual, that is, they experience sexual attraction only in the presence of an intense emotional connection or bonding with a partner. Demisexual people are considered in the asexual community on the spectrum between asexuality and sexuality, also known as grey sexuality. They suggest that a continuum exists of asexuality and asexual people are not a homogeneous category. Defining asexuality as lack of attraction helps us busting some very common myths about asexual people meets that have made their way in the mind of lay people, but also mental health professionals. For example, asexual people are often assumed to suffer from fears or anxieties or repulsion for sex, not to have ever had sexual experiences, not to experience a sexual desire, not to have sexual fantasies, not to experience a sexual arousal, not to have romantic relationships. These assumptions are all wrong and plenty of research data prove this. We will review these studies briefly in the following slides. So let's start with asexuality and sexual desire. 
Many self-identified asexual individuals claim they actually don't have any sexual desire at all. However, a relevant part of asexual people practice masturbation, although often with a non-sexual function, for instance, to clean out the plumbing once in a while, in the words of an asexual participant in the study by Broughton and colleagues in 2010. So it is not properly true that asexual people have no sexual desire at all, but what they do not experience is a sexual desire directed towards others. In a large sample of asexual men and women, Yule and colleagues investigated how many of them masturbated at least on a monthly basis and compared these figures with a sample of sexual men and women. Results show that around 90% of sexual men and women masturbate at least monthly, a prevalence which was not different from that of asexual men. However, in the asexual female sample, 70% of women masturbated regularly and this percentage was significantly lower than both groups in the sexual sample and from asexual men. From this data, we can conclude that the large majority of asexual people have autoerotic practices on a regular basis. But what are the motives for masturbating and is there any difference between sexual and asexual people? In the same study by Yule and colleagues, the authors investigated motives for masturbation comparing asexual and sexual men and women. It was found that among women, asexual people more frequently masturbated because they simply felt that they had to do it, while other motivations including sexual pleasure, relief tension and fun were more frequent in sexual men. As for men, no significant differences emerged between asexual and sexual people with the only exception of sexual pleasure which was a more frequent motivation among sexual men. In the same study, the prevalence of people who have never had sexual fantasies was compared between the four groups. Results show that 35% of asexual women and 20% of asexual men never had sexual fantasies. This result is in itself very interesting as any sex therapist is taught at school that sexual fantasies are universal that everyone has to have them. The prevalence of sexual men and women who never experience sexual fantasies is less than 3% for both groups. But what do asexual people fantasize about? The same study also explored this issue in asexual men and women. As for women, it came out that compared to their sexual counterparts, they are more likely to have sexual fantasies that do not involve themselves and with fictional human characters. As for asexual men, they were found, compared to their sexual counterparts, to have sexual fantasies that again do not involve themselves and in which they are the object of desire of someone else. By combining data on masturbation and sexual fantasies, the authors conclude that 16% of asexual women and 6% of asexual men do not masturbate and do not have sexual fantasies. However, the other side of the coin is that 51% of asexual women and 75% of asexual men do masturbate and do fantasize about sex. These results are very important for sex therapists to discriminate between asexuality on one side and hypoactive sexual desire disorder on the other. We will get back to that very soon. Another important research result is that asexual people have no problem in the arousal phase of the sexual response cycle as both erection and lubrication are there. In other words, in the words of participant two in the Brotto study in 2010, I did test the equipment, so to say, and everything works fine, pleasurable and all. It's just not actually attracted to anything. Asexual people teach us that romantic attraction and sexual attraction are two distinct and independent forms of connection and bonding, although most sexual people and some sex therapists tend to assume that romantic relationship must include sex and you can't love someone fully if you're not sexually attracted to them. Asexual people are not necessarily aromantic and, as a matter of fact, 
around one third of asexual people are in long-term relationships and 70% had reported ever previously being in relationships, as suggested by a study by Brotto and colleagues in 2010. In the words of participant one in the Brotto study, basically, I just enjoy being close to someone and spending time with them and doing things that make them happy, not sexually. Well, like I like being touched and held, but I just don't really want to do anything sexual, if that makes any sense. Like I desire to be held and like to cuddle and stuff, but not to have sex. A big issue for sex therapists is to discriminate between asexuality as sexual orientation and sexual dysfunctions and problems. This is because in the past, several hypotheses were proposed in order to explain asexuality, and most of them suggested a direct connection with psychopathology, including asexuality as a result of autism spectrum disorder or severe personality pathology like schizoid personality disorder, for example. Also, asexuality has been interpreted as a form of para paraphilic disorder, namely identityless sexuality, or, or as an extreme form of hyperactive sexual uh, desire disorder. Although it is now established that asexuality is not a sexual dysfunction or disorder, I think it is important to explore in more depth the differences between hyperactive sexual desire disorder and asexuality and this might be of particular interest to two sex therapists. The DSM-5 proposes two diagnostic categories to conceptualize lack of sexual desire, one for men, the so-called male hypoactive sexual desire disorder, and one for women, female sexual interest slash arousal disorder. If we consider male hypoactive sexual desire disorder, it includes among its diagnostic criteria Criterion A that states persistently or recurrently deficient sexual erotic thoughts or fantasies and desire for sexual activity. The same we found in the female version, that is a female sexual interest arousal disorder, where we can find criteria like absent interest in sexual activity or absent um, sexual erotic thoughts or fantasies, which can be mistaken for asexuality. However, the DSM itself contains a caveat against diagnosing people who self-identify as a sexual with a diagnosis of HSDD, as it quotes, if a lifelong lack of sexual desire is better explained by one's self-identification as asexual, then a diagnosis would not be made. Another important variable to consider is, in fact, onset. If we assume that asexuality is a sexual orientation and as such mostly stable over time, it must, be, uh, it must necessarily accompany the person since their very early years, while sexual dysfunction may be acquired and appear later in life. As we have seen for most asexual people, asexuality is who they are, not the problem they have. Also, this stress is another key feature that can easily help to discriminate between lack of sexual desire and asexuality. The stress must necessarily be present to diagnose any sexual dysfunctions, including HSDD or any mental health problem in general, but it does not necessarily characterize the personal experience of asexual people. Actually, distress can be present in some asexual people, but mostly as a consequence of minority stress, as we will see shortly. Finally, it must be noted that while the DSM focuses on desire, asexuality is defined as lack of attraction. And these are two very different constructs. As we have seen, being asexual does not necessarily mean having no sexual desire, as it is evident from the research data on masturbation and sexual fantasies we have reviewed before. So what kind of help can we offer as sex therapists to asexual people? First of all, we can help them with self-exploration and coming out. It must be kept in mind that asexuality is still not well known and many asexual people struggle to name who they are. Asexual people are actually an invisible category. Another big issue is helping people to overcome the feeling of being different. 
a participant in the Broughton colleagues' study, said, I always knew that I was different, and I always knew that I didn't have that interest like my friends had. I always had this babysitting job, and I thought it was great because they would always give me a huge tip. But then my friends would go, oh, we went to this really cool party, and everybody was making out, and it was so much fun, and you should come next year. I would make a point of getting a babysitting job because there was no way I wanted to be in that kind of environment because I just didn't want to. Another important issue that may bring asexual people to sex counseling is working with discordant couples. Some asexual people are currently in relationships with another asexual person. In such cases, there is little need for negotiating sexual activity since both partners are presumably uninterested in sex. In these couples, both members are able to be naked and physically close to their partners without the pressure or expectation that it would lead to intercourse. In the couples where a partner is asexual, the asexual member has to negotiate what types of sexual activities they are willing to take part in, the frequency and the boundaries around the relationship in the event that the asexual does not engage in any kind of sexual activity with the partner. Sex counselling can be very helpful for couples struggling with this kind of issues. Some conclusions and take home messages. In spite of what the name may suggest, asexual people do have a sexual life. It is also important not to make assumptions. As we have seen, many assumptions that are widespread among lay people did not stand the proof of science. Another word to keep in mind is diversity. Behind the same level of asexual, there is a wide range of experiences and attitudes which should be respected and celebrated rather than stigmatized and pathologized. I recommend anyone to check out the Asexual Visibility and Education Network website to gain more information and resources on the asexual community. Thank you very much for your attention.